Hello everyone, I hope that you are well. This is going to be a non-video lecture. I've been moving and I'm kind of sleepy, but I would like to go over the agony of Eros. I'm gonna be talking about this book this Friday with the translator of this book and also um, a couple of other people. So let's go ahead and start with the back cover, some of the back cover, the summary. Han considers the threat to love and desire in today's society. So right there, there's a question. Do you consider love, the practices of love and the reality or the existence of desire to be challenged or threatened in any way? And by what? If you know anything about Han, he's probably going to refer to as a source our preoccupation and obsession with social media and how we navigate that and encounter others and communicate with others. He's also going to talk about narcissism and how, um, you know, we're all kind of striking out on our own in sort of this capitalistic competitiveness. And so we don't really see the other. So he says, love requires the courage to accept self-negation for the sake of discovering the other, and other is capitalized. In a world of fetishized individualism, so there you go, and technologically mediated social interaction, okay, it is the other that is eradicated, not the self. In today's increasingly narcissistic society, we have come to look for love and desire within the inferno of the same. Han offers a survey of the threats to Eros, drawing on a wide range of sources. Lars von Trier's film Melancholia, which Zizek likes to talk about. Fifty Shades of Grey, which I've regretfully read some of. I think the movie was probably better. Michel Foucault, uh, Hegel, Baudrillard, Flaubert, Bart, Plato, and others. Han considers the pornographication of society and shows how pornography profanes Eros. And I think he is not really talking about, or not just talking about pornography as it is, but uh, uses that term to critique some uh, types of social media content, such as the selfie which he does in his book, Saving Beauty, addresses capitalism's leveling of essential differences. So he critiques basically the differences that are positive and can be commodified rather than the uh, differences that cannot be. And discusses the politics of Eros in today's burnout society. To be dead to love, Han argues, is to be dead to thought itself. All right, getting in a little bit of Heidegger, perhaps. All right, so there is a foreword by Elaine Badiou. So I'm going to read that. The reinvention of love, because how, how can we skip over that? And I wrote in on this page, love is the radical experience of the other. Are we willing to do that? I mean, right off the bat, I think about the divorce rate and the discontent and dissatisfaction that I think a lot of people experience in their relationships. And then uh, as opposed to sort of the initial rush of adrenaline that you get when you maybe meet someone new and then it sort of dulls and then we move on. You know, he might be talking about that and he might be talking about the pragmatics of perhaps like swiping on an app to find the best profile. And also, you know, he might be referring to reality dating shows and just how calculating and uh, superficial they are based on kind of easy commonalities instead of maybe a deeper more intimate encounter 
In this book, Byung Chul Han bears witness to how love, in the strong sense that a long historical tradition has granted it, is threatened. Perhaps it is already dead. At any rate, it is gravely ill, hence the title, The Agony of Eros. And saying that love is dead um, and threatened, this reminds me of how many people claim that in our postmodern era now we live in a post-truth era and my heater just went on it's it's april but it's still it's snowing it's snowing in colorado so there you go um so hopefully that won't be too annoying it'll shut off in a second and so in a post-truth era truth is threatened because people no longer care about it it's not the claim go as the claim goes, it's not that we can't understand the truth, although that might have preceded our, you know, kind of indifference. Hopelessness might have preceded our indifference. Um, but it's not that. It's just that we no longer care. We enjoy reality shows and don't really care if they're actually real or not because they're entertaining. Um, yeah. So, so that makes me think that maybe this is what it means when they say love is dead that we no longer care about love we only care about maybe fulfilling our narcissistic needs you know in narcissism you don't really see the other person and it's all about getting your needs met and manipulating or interacting with that person and i might be drawing too much on like actual clinical narcissistic personality disorder but that's what i have uh, dabbled in a bit researching um you don't really create space for a non-attached enjoyment or pleasure or existence of another person and I, i would say that that is really rare because that takes work and that also takes maybe maturity and um, being an evolved person. But whose blows have struck true love so low? The perpetrators are contemporary individualism, the effort to determine the market value of everything and the set of monetary interests that now govern all conduct. And I can kind of see this turn toward individualism, um, especially in a capitalist society where everyone is kind of looking out, or many people are kind of looking out for themselves that we just try, you know, we want our YouTube channel to be really successful. Who cares about other people's? We want them to fail. We want to win. You know, that's a very... um, competitiveness is a very individualized kind of uh, state or if you look at the relationships of exchange that are sometimes uh, encountered in the world um, you know whether both people are just finding that they're going to agree to a relationship because it's convenient or you know they need another person to pay the rent or we're exchanging beauty and youth for money and power uh you know any sort of pragmatic purpose i think or agenda in in being in a relationship is is individualistic And you're kind of commodifying the self because you're looking at the exchange value. In truth, love refuses to accept all norms of the contemporary world, the world of globalized capitalism, because it is not a simple pact of pleasant coexistence between two individuals. Rather, it is the radical experience, perhaps to the outermost point of the existence of the other. To demonstrate as much, the author offers a kind of phenomenology of true love, including sexual love, and tracks down in their many forms the threats it faces. On the one hand, this involves, being, this involves describing what occurs in the absolute experience of alterity, which is just kind of another word for saying otherness, the state of otherness. 
On the other, it means indicting on, a, array, on an array of different registers. All that draws us away from such an experience and even prevents us from seeing that it exists at all or the consequences this circumstance brings. Implacably, Han argues that the minimum condition for true love is possessing sufficient courage to accept self-negation for the sake of discovering the other. And I guess I would say potentially uh, courage is a difficult thing to have. Um, being the, the, the courage to being an authentic self instead of a self that pleases others that you know anytime we're I think marketing ourselves in a way where our agenda is maybe something other than what we're actually doing like what we're doing is a means to an end instead of an end in itself then I think that we lack the courage of living life in the way that we would want even if our projects fail and are not successful and no one likes us i mean and a lot of that is not necessarily uh the fault of anyone who's who, who's feeling the need that they have to market themselves in an unauthentic way and i think anytime um someone tries to brand themselves you know human beings are complex we're not always one way our personalities aren't you know super consistent in the way that they're always going to manifest in the same on the same register with the same emotional context At the same time, he provides an intensive survey of all the traps set for and attacks perpetrated on the very possibility of Eros in a world that, as it stands, cares only for agreement, agreeability, and narcissistic gratification. So if we have all of these, just thinking about love and relationships, if we have all of these desires, these pros and cons, we're kind of dehumanizing the other and thinking of a relationship just from our perspective this work proves utterly absorbing precisely because of its unlikely combination of physical rigor it concludes with a striking quotation from deleuze and guattari and a wealth of far-ranging sources the first chapter enlists Lars von Trier's Man Melancholia, as well as Bruegel's The Hunters in the Snow and Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, both of which are featured in von Trier's film, to show how the disastrous interruption of pure exteriority, the holy other, represents a catastrophe for the ordinary balance of the subject. So in Melancholia, as Zizek explains it, I think in his book, The Event, he talks about this, I think it's this woman and then maybe this couple, I think maybe the woman is sister to uh, the woman that's married, the wife. But um, the woman has, I think, like maybe debilitating anxiety and what's going to happen is there's some kind of other planetary existence that's going to crash into earth and uh, i think maybe through her life you know anxiety makes you fearful and want to control you know people and situations and when this woman sees the planetary entity uh, heading toward earth you know the moments before the, the crash and the cataclysm she finds a catharsis and she is like enjoyably and erotically and sensually relieved of her anxiety because there's just no point to try to control everything there's kind of this self uh, salvation and annihilation almost so you think about like the medieval mystics and their relationship to Christ. 
By the same token, however, apparent disaster offers the good fortune of escape and absence from oneself. Okay, so that's kind of what I was talking about. And ultimately shows the way to redemption. After a severe critique, so are we by, by getting into relationships narcissistically, are we robbing ourselves actually of the opportunity for salvation from encountering the other? After a severe critique of Foucault, who was, who was faulted for valorizing ability power in opposition to the passivity of knowledge, I never agree with his critiques of Foucault. I think he could say that about Nietzsche. Nietzsche valorizes power, but Foucault doesn't. He, he discloses the, the subtle, seemingly innocuous manifestations of power so that we can all see how we're actually being manipulated even if we don't know we're being manipulated i don't think that's really valorizing power and therefore performance of course i haven't read all of Foucault, so what do i know the second chapter features a measured appreciation of levinas and buber who discerned that as Han puts it, Eros is a relationship to the other situated beyond achievement. And if I ever mispronounce a philosopher's name, please tell me in the comments and spell it out phonetically because I'd love to know that the right pronunciation. Sometimes I just guess. Situated beyond achievement. So it's not we're trying to be, I don't know, would he, would he critique power couples? Performance and can. What escapes Foucault entirely, I, which I don't think anything escapes Foucault, but all right, and Levinas merely touches on, is a fact, a central argument of the book. The negativity of otherness, that is the atopia of the other, which eludes all ability, is constitutive of erotic experience. So... I think the negativity, uh, so Han uses negativity in, I think, two ways, the colloquial way, and then also uh, meaning absence or lack. And I think that the erotic has something to do for Han and just in general of not giving it all away, so to speak. And by... Uh, having some mystery, having some ability to be less attached and, and curious, to be curious. It's kind of like you are, you are um, kind of destroying the erotic, for instance. I don't know, maybe. This, this is, I don't know, what do you think? Um, are you destroying the erratic? When you demand to know everything, all the secrets, the past relationships of your significant other, you demand the passwords to all of their, uh, their tech. Is that destroying the other because you're trying to control the other? You're trying to make the other into something digestible for you. I don't know. Atopia means placelessness. So the placeness, placelessness of the other, you can't position them, you can't determine you're not their god, you can't determine their positionality, their situation, si situatedness, maybe. The striking formulation represents, as it were, the matrix of the work as a whole. Quote, only by way of being able not to be able does the other appear. So I wrote in my book, sounds like Edith Stein's idea of religion. Um, she has this, I read her selected works, so I don't know exactly which book it is. But in one of the selections of that book, she talks about her experience of kind of failing and be feeling hopeless in terms of just I, I think the everydayness of life you know securing maybe 
certain things in life that she wanted or a certain relationship, maybe even with God or with others. And so it was when she just kind of let go and let God in a way um, that God had kind of appeared or, or she felt um, God's presence. I had a similar experience. I remember being in my first apartment that I was in like by myself in my early 20s and uh, I was kind of overwhelmed by just the responsibility of it all but not even the responsibility just just wondering if I could do you know adulting I guess typical millennial right and uh, I was at the same time just feeling I guess distance from God and with my prayers just in general and you know I wanted to call out to God and I remember kind of thinking you know in a sort of frustrated way you know I don't hear you you never talk how am I supposed to have a relationship with you know speaking to nothing in a wall and I just kind of had this moment of giving up but also revelation that you know fine if if you if if you won't listen to me I'll listen I'll just whatever if you say something if I feel something I don't care and I slid down the door and I was crying and I just like felt a release I don't know maybe that doesn't relate the experience of love then is shot through with powerlessness, the price to be paid for all revelation of the other. By way of striking, I think it's maybe a relationship that is not trying to demand or possess, which are both kind of harmful ways, I think, of relating to the other. By way of a striking reading of Hegel, the third chapter identifies the power of love as a new measure of the absolute. There can be no absolute without absolute negativity. And this is why I do not think that Han is really a postmodernist, a postmodern thinker. I think he's really a neo-modernist. I mean, he loves the modern writers and ideas. Only in love can spirit assume the experience of its own annihilation. That is, as Hegel puts it, preserve itself even in death. Because for the other to arrive, one must no longer be anything at all. And I kind of think of the idea of the dialectic of death and rebirth and in the tarot deck, uh, in the major arcana, the... Um, the cards, the tower, and the hangman. There's kind of that happened in the middle of the journey, the fool's journey, where there's kind of a reversal. There's a death, so we can keep moving and growing. In declaring as much, Hegel made Bataille possible. Han quotes with delight the latter's terrible words quote, Eroticism, it may be said, is assenting to life up to the point of death. The fourth chapter revisits the classic opposition between eroticism and pornography, taking up a gambin and Baudrillard, and not without ample criticism, Han shows how pornography is nothing other than the profanation of eros. So maybe making something that's sacred, um, mundane or profane. These pages include a brilliant appraisal of the culture and value of exhibition. Capitalism is aggravating the pornographication of society, so many syllables, by making everything a commodity and putting it on, a dis on display. And I think this is a really important point that Han is trying to make and something that we should remember when he is contrasting the negative with the positive, like negative with positive difference. It has something to do, in part, with commodification. Knowing no other use for sexuality, it profanes eros into porn. Love alone permits eroticism or sex to be ritualized instead of being put on show. That's interesting. How is a ritual, which is, in part, a performance, different than 
a show. I guess a show can be commodified. A show is trying to sell something. A ritual is trying to encounter the divine. Thereby is the mystery of the other, which contemporary exhibitionism is degrading into a dull article for consumption, preserved even in nakedness. So I think it's the difference between commodified, com commodifying our bodies for some kind of gain, whether that's financial or fame or power or something, um, and uh, putting out content that we think is artistic and that we like. And then, therefore, other people will probably enjoy as well. The fifth chapter takes, so it's, I guess it's either with pure, a pure agenda or a lack of agenda. The fifth chapter takes the reader on a journey in the company of Eva Aluse, Why Love Hurts, which I have, what do I have? Oh, I have The End of Love, I have a sociology on negative, of negative relations, which I really I feel like I want to read that today or tomorrow. Lies in the throes of agony because, oh wait, I don't think I read that. Okay, the company of Eva Elias, Why Love Hurts, I stopped it at the title. Flaubert, Bart, and others to explore how love, so rich in varied fantasies about the other, lies in the throw of agony because the contemporary universe of normalization and capitalization presents the inferno of the same at every turn. I think the inferno of the same is, is really something interesting to unpack, but I'm gonna wait to see what he says. Hans' profound analysis shows how the barriers, borders, and exclusions that capitalism produces, especially between rich and poor, drive not so much from difference as from the identical. Quote, money as a matter of principle makes everything the same. It levels essential differences. As configurations for shutting out and excluding, such borders abolish fantasies of the other. Oh, okay, so do we want fantasies of the other? I guess longing is life. Uh, it's nice to have a crush because uh, it makes life more colorful, I guess. But how does money make everything the same? I guess when you think of the examples of luxury brands, for instance, you know, even when they're rather hideous and really ugly, um, maybe it, it levels everyone's desires to want that particular object and erases aesthetic idiosyncrasies. The sixth chapter reveals the connection between love and politics Via a subtle discussion of Plato and his dynamic conception of the soul, which love steers toward the idea, idea with a capital I, a marked contrast emerges to what Han calls burnout society, a remarkable coinage extremely well suited to our world today. The author offers a strong reading of my own thesis that love is a two scene, a dual perspective, and by virtue of this fact represents a kind of basic political matrix. This chapter concludes with love's transformation, transformative power. Quote, Eros manifests itself as the revolutionary yearning for an entirely different way of loving and another kind of society. Thereby, it maintains fidelity to what is to come. I was just thinking, my pause was that I was thinking, how does burnout society sort of contrast with what he is talking about I think that when relationships are truly intimate and renewed by breath pause and distance that they are life-giving instead of life sucking <laughs> I don't know out of um, and I think it's a it's a sort of careful dance and walk 
for sure. It's it's kind of a relationships. I think the way Han's talking about them are kind of mosaics and um, something that we craft artistically for itself and not for any again sort of like narcissistic need like I have achieved something if I'm in a relationship um, I'm thinking of the comedy of uh, oh my goodness what is her name Oh, I can't believe I know. I don't know her name. Anyway, she is this girl, I think, in her 20s. She's blonde. She always talks about how she has, like, a face that a mother would love instead of, you know, um, something else. So, oh, what is her name? Okay. Anyway, she has, she has this really funny um, sketch where she's talking about, you know, how she was engaged for a while and you know it didn't work out and she was like no you know it's okay my ring kept getting caught on different things like my freedom and um, she talks about how when she's going through it just like gave her you know this ego boost because when she went she she goes through target and she says um and i'm sorry if you actually know the skit that i'm talking about because i'm doing a horrible job of telling it it's it's really funny when she does it she's going through target and she is kind of saying oh no i don't need help and she does this little thing and this is the where i wanted to get to the point she does this thing where she like um covers her mouth and uh, kind of it kind of like has a voice of a of like i guess a speaker uh in a in a store like you know when someone said when the when someone like calls through their microphone and says hey we need someone on like aisle nine or whatever um and and like the speaker says oh she's leveled up okay that was horrible i'm so sorry i gave that example but it's just kind of it's an interesting social commentary on how people feel like they've achieved something if they're in a relationship as opposed to being single and how they have achieved something if they have you know the basically basic like pleasantville dream of a white picket fence and a house and kids and a dog and a person and how you know i don't know being a spinster is a failure is it i don't know um maybe not to that person the final chapter affirms that love is necessary for thought to exist at all to be able to think one must first have been a friend a lover so concludes an acomium of love joined to a radical critique of a love that refuses it to be dead to love is to be dead to thought okay i don't remember that chapter So I don't, I don't know, I'm really interested in that juxtaposition. Though slim, this book is rich and rewarding as sublime in its praise of alterity, as it is unsparing in its critique of the modern subjects, depressive narcissism, exhaustion, and individualism. Needless to say, it provokes further debate. To open just one avenue of discussion, it is absolutely... (coughs) It is absolutely certain that the only way to oppose a consumerist and contractual conception of alterity is to abolish the self on a sublime but all impossible scale in order to encounter the other must absolute negativity be mustered to counter the crass positivity of repetitive self-serving gratification and i guess i can kind of see this i mean i think that in a way this is why emma chamberlain is so popular because she kind of she kind of disrupted what one would think would be a marketable presence for kind of where she is today which is you know a 20 i don't know how old she is 24 year old living in this mansion being asked to be representative of louis vuitton and going to being an interviewer at the met gala you know she 
she burps and she uh, isn't doesn't put on makeup when she has a, when she records her videos or her hair is kind of messy and she is she's just very very much herself and I think that's that's very beloved she wasn't self-conscious about a self you know it wasn't perfectly curated although I know she put in a ton of she puts in a ton of effort for her videos so I don't know I just think maybe maybe that's that's why she is she is beloved After all, the notion of amorous oblativity, the vanishing of the self and the other, has a long and glorious history. The mystical love of God, for example, as passionately described in the poem, poems of St. John of the Cross. Yes, okay, medieval mystics, love it. Um, and I think that, I mean, we all understand that creativity is stifled when... We get too obsessed with the algorithm or likes. You know, we start we start paying homage to the direction of of I guess you know, subscribers and, and likes and good comments rather than following our own true path, which may be very unappetizing to people or, you know, subject ourselves to judgment. Yet now, after the death of God, is it even necessary to continue down this path? Perhaps this leg of the journey has lasted long enough. Another road may stretch ahead along the lines of a world beginning with a two of love. This world, whose foundations lie in we two, singular, would belong neither to me nor to the other, but would exist for all. Isn't there metaphorically a kind of ultra leftism hiding in the unlimited and absolute assumption of the negative and alterity? I love that there's a critique in this. Um, is it even necessary to continue down this path? Perhaps this leg of the journey has lasted long enough. I often think that when reading Han, I often think, isn't what Han is fighting for what we've tried for so long to fight against and have something new? Do we really want to go back to it? And sometimes when he talks about the other, it's a bit, I hesitate a bit because when I was in, when I was in my doctoral program, of women's studies, or maybe it was even in my master's, there was quite a bit of talk about how you should not ex exoticize, eroticize the other. And sort of, because Han, in a way, sort of talks about the other as, uh, and the relationship and the orientation to the other in a very self-serving way. It's like his argument is it will benefit you if you have an other that will be a perfect other for you, that will be a mysterious kind of, I don't know, I've used this before, a manic pixie dream girl, or you know, something that will allure and, and seduce and you know, bring the erotic to you. I mean, that also seems kind of narcissistic. That also seems self-serving. And I don't know if that allows the other their own humanity. I guess it just depends on what he means. Perhaps in material terms, fidelity and love amounts to two combined instances of forgetting that come to work together in a way that admits universal validation for the sake of a shared reality. See, there's this critique is critiquing Hans' rhetoric of asymmetry. When he talks about the self and the other, he really focuses on what the self gets from that, I think. Whatever the case, this remarkable essay, an intellectual experience of the first order, affords one of the best ways to gain full awareness of and join in one of the most pressing struggles of our day. The defense, that is to say, as Rimbaud desired it, the reinvention of love.
All right, well, I'm going to stop there, I think. I thought that I'd get further than just this introduction, but that introduction was so amazing and rich. Oh, I love it. I love it. So hopefully we'll do more um, very soon. Thanks so much for listening.